630 But just before we go to the phone lines, I, I, I do want to hear more about the quote because I've heard the quote before, obviously. Mm-hmm. And as I was saying to Miss Dixon, my generation, the millennials and certainly Gen Z, when they hear of FinSAC, a lot of times the question is, why should we care? Mm-hmm. And I understand the government to be saying these archives will assist in the understanding of that period and what it cost the country. But you know we're not a reading people. Mm-hmm. So the idea that most people will sit and go through, I've started to go through the documents, it's unlikely to happen. Mm-hmm. So let me go back to the, the quote from Ronald Thwaites. Mm-hmm. You were attempting to explain the context mm-hmm. uh, in which that quote was made. Let yes. me hear that. First of all, I know the quote very well because Thwait said that quote in an interview with me. No. Ah. Yes, it was in an interview with me he made that quote. And that quote was a criticism of the sustained high interest rate policy that was going on at the time under the Patterson administration of which Omar Davis was a finance minister. Mm -hmm. Later, after the financial meltdown, yes, the sustained high interest rate policy, and you would have heard this, Mm -hmm. was identified as the basis of the collapse of several of the institutions Mm -hmm. because what happened You borrow money at, let us say, 10%, and you collateralize it at that interest rate. The government of the day jacked up interest rate to, it went as far as 100%, yes? All in an effort to mop up the supply of money, liquidity Mm -hmm. in the economy. Because it was felt, the theory was, that if you reduce the supply of money in the economy, then you would be able to bring down inflation because people would not have money to spend as much. to spend and to buy right. scarce foreign exchange. That was a theory. Mm-hmm. It was meant to be an initial shock to the system. That is high interest rates. However, it just went on for too long. Mm -hmm. And uh, viable businesses, viable loans, just became unsustainable. Pause. Because I've questioned, because I've seen that in the literature, and I've questioned, certainly there must have been voices at the time who were urging the minister to bring that policy to an end. Yes. Why didn't he follow it, your best recollection? That those calls, why didn't he heed those calls? Looking back now, 2020 vision, I think at the time, as a country, as a media, Mm -hmm. as an academic community, those of us in politics as well, frankly, the level of financial literacy was wanting, Hmm. was not strong enough. Cabinet ministers told me after that that Omar Davis virtually terrorized cabinet members into thinking that this was the orthodoxy, this was how it ought to go, and he was not effectively challenged. Yeah? Being the PhD he is. Being the PhD he is. Yes? And... uh, As a result, we pay a heavy price for a policy that had gone terribly wrong. There's also the issue, you know, uh, Ricardo, and some people don't want to hear that, but if we are going to be faithful, yes, to the truth. Some of these institutions were also being run by executives who were conflicted and... uh, in an environment where the financial regulatory system was weak. People were making 
fin we're, we're, we're doing financial engineering, yes, it, without what we now have as a solid regulatory framework, framework right. to guide what you could do or not do, what ratios you need to maintain in terms of ensuring the viability of a financial institution. That was absent. It was later, having had the, the, the meltdown and the experience, that we put, in place we put those guardrails in. What do you mean when you say they were conflicted? They were conflicted, for example, you running a bank, you were the chairman, the executive chairman. Hmm? You know what executive chairman mm, executive mean. Power and you exactly. The board, right? and exactly. And then you had the, the emergence of groups of companies. So you had a, a merchant bank. Mm -hmm. You have an insurance company. You have a, which other one? Merchant banks, insurance. You would have a, probably a securities dealership. Mm. Yes? So you had several finance-related entities mm. of which you were involved. an executive chairman mm -hmm. or definitely involved at a very senior and influential level where you could impact decision-making. The politics has always been competitive. So I imagine, again, at that time, you'd have somebody like Edward Siaga as the opposition leader mm -hmm. yes who i i must imagine was part of the urging to be careful because he certainly had well he's credited as having good financial management skills and you know financial management know-how mm -hmm. what was his role in terms of your recollection of him being in the parliament standing up i imagine as we have the competitive politics that first must have of happened. all i i recall two major uh, interventions by Siaga. The first would have been about the PNP came back to power. 89? 89, February. February. Mm -hmm. 89. Michael Manley came back to power stressing continuity. He had had his road to Damascus conversion from democratic socialism to the market economy. She was going to follow orthodoxy. Yes. And at the time, the 1990s, there was this push to liberalize the Jamaican economy. Mm -hmm. And with that, liberalize the foreign exchange market. Mm. Because before that, we had controls. Right. And if you were to travel, how much you could buy in foreign exchange. All part of an effort to one, stop the dollar from running, mm -hmm. stop inflation, yes, and to mask what was the weak performance of the Jamaican economy, yes. And when Michael decided to liberalize the, the, the foreign exchange market, there was a huge debate over the usefulness and whether that would be prudent. And the liberalization. Of the foreign exchange. Whether that would be prudent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he stuck with it. He was supported by some powerful, influential voices in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And equally, those voices that disagreed. Mm -hmm. And he persisted. And I remember it was a parliamentary debate, budget debate, where Siaga said to Michael Manley, don't do it. Don't do it. We are not in a position, yes, to have a free market, liberalized foreign exchange system. Don't do it. And he went on, pressed on. By 1991, 92, yes, the thing blew up. Yes, the dollar started to fly. Yeah, and uh, we were in problems. Inflation was going through the roof. The dollar was running. The costs of goods and services were going. Yeah, which, yeah, some say, I'm no economist, mm -hmm. laid the basis for what took place later in the mid 1990s with financial institutions going under. Collapsing. And then, 
in another on another occasion this would have been about I would have you you just asked me so I'm just yes. going yeah. from memory. Yeah, this would have been about ninety three now. 90. When did Omar Davis become finance minister? Omar Davis ninety two or ninety three, I believe. No. It was before that? It was after that, I think. Okay. He entered the parliament in ninety four in a by election. I think ninety four or ninety three. Okay. <coughs> and Siaga, in another parliamentary sitting, I don't know if this was a budget debate, mm -hmm. but in another parliamentary sitting, I remember reporting on it, Siaga stood up in Gordon House and said to the government, said to Omar Davis, that the financial sector was in trouble. Companies were on the edge, were on the brink. And Omar Davis, with his usual style, mm -hmm and the very arrogant he was, accused Siaga as being unpatriotic, alarming, yes, meant to really discredit the country when Siaga said that you need to help the financial institutions now because they were in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, There was a mismatch of assets and liabilities and he looked at Omar and said, you need to intervene now. And he was dismissed. And yet, just before we go to the phone lines, and yet, that kind of financial management was, has to, I have to say, was rewarded at the polls. And I'm wondering now if a large part of that is what you conceded, that you're all in media, senior ministers of the cabinet, other interests... <coughs> didn't do a good enough job of explaining to the Jamaican people what was at stake. I think so. I think so. Yeah? Because some of us didn't even understand mm. what was happening, if one is to be truthful. Didn't even understand it. Yeah, we were catching up. Yeah? And uh, Omar was this perceived as this intellectual giant. Mm. Yeah? And as I said, cabinet ministers told me, debate was virtually muted at cabinet until, you know, what hit the fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 